Welcome to Morning Devotion for Tuesday, March 30th. Uh, today for our consideration, Psalm 69. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 69 is mostly a, a hymn of, of supplication. It's it's a prayer. It's it's crying out to God for help. And, and then also... Um, this first part alternates between that call for help and then explaining the circumstances that make that that prayer necessary. If you're not already familiar with Psalm 69, a lot of it may still be uh, very familiar. Uh, this psalm is, is alluded to and quoted repeatedly in the New Testament. Uh, I chased down a few of those, those times in the New Testament. Um, I stopped at around 10 uh, explicit references or where it's clearly referring to it. Uh, my search was far from exhaustive, um, and, but what all those references make really clear is that this is a psalm uh, written by David, but these words are actually the words of Christ, describing his suffering for sin, his suffering for us, Even though, and even though King David was around uh, more than a thousand years before Jesus, um, he writes it all in the, in the present tense as if uh, he's already suffering all of those things. Uh, so let's read. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are my enemies without cause. Those who seek to destroy me. I am forced to restore what I did not steal. So here's this first this first prayer, uh, a cry for rescue. Save me, my God. The image is of, of a man drowning. The waters are surrounding him. He seems like he's about to die. And what's worse, it seems like God isn't even answering his prayers. He's worn out from calling on God. And his misery is made even worse by the fact that even though he's surrounded by the water that's about to kill him, he's thirsty. And he's in danger because of his enemies uh, who have no valid reason to, to hate him, no valid accusations. Uh, these next two verses, You, God, know my folly. My guilt is not hidden from you. Lord, the Lord Almighty, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. God of Israel, may those who seek you not be put to shame because of me. So even though he's suffering and even though his enemies have no valid basis to accuse him, he still acknowledges his own sinfulness. And this, this kind of presents a challenge. So let me go back to five. This presents a challenge. How can this be Jesus Christ speaking? How could the sinless Son of God have any guilt? Well, let's, uh, let me just take a little detour uh, from the psalm for a little because this is a crucial point. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And then already in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So each sin that you and, and I and everyone in the world committed fell on him until the weight of all that sin crushed him. Uh, and, and as he bore that burden, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Messiah can speak of that guilt being his guilt because that was ours. Our guilt was transferred to him. Uh, and, and more evidence follows that this is actually the Christ we're talking about. For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. Uh, that verse 9 uh, probably sounds familiar. In John chapter 2, uh, it's connected with Jesus' first cleansing of the temple. When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. When I put on sackcloth, people make sport of me. Those who sit at the gate mock me, and I'm the song of the drunkards. Meaning both the high and the low are looking down on him. 
Um, and now before we, we read on, um, here at verse 13, the description of the Messiah's suffering is interrupted by a prayer for delivery. And this this prayer in these next couple of verses, it emphasizes three things. Uh, the greatness of his suffering, uh, the greatness of his enemy's hatred to him, and the greatness of the Father's goodness and love that is the basis of this prayer. Jesus himself could actually pray as one who deserved to be saved, but this prayer actually serves as a model for us who can only pray as sinners who are fully dependent on his grace. But I pray to you, Lord, in the time of your favor, in your great love, O, o God, answer me with your sure salvation. Rescue me from the mire. Do not let me sink. Deliver me from those who hate me from the deep waters. Do not let the flood waters engulf me or the depths swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, out of the goodness of your love. In your great mercy, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I am in trouble. Come near and rescue me. Deliver me because of my foes. And then after this, in verse 19, it continues um, with un more of the Messiah's suffering at the hands of his enemies. And then this is a prophecy that we see fulfilled in the gospel accounts of Jesus' suffering. His enemies taunted him. Uh, his disciples abandoned him. Peter denied him. They offered him vinegar and gall. Jesus cried out for deliverance, but he couldn't be delivered until his work of redemption was complete. And we know that God accepted God the Father accepted this suffering as our suffering. Uh, starting in verse 19, You know how I am scorned, disgraced and shamed. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. This, this next section... Uh, starting in verse 22, we have to just acknowledge this is, it's horrifying. This is a prayer for the damnation of his enemies. May the table set before them become a snare. May it become retribution and a trap. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Pour out your wrath on them. Let your fierce anger overtake them. May their place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in their tents. For they persecute those you wound and talk about the pain of those you hurt. Charge them with crime upon crime. Do not let them share in your salvation. May they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. How are we supposed to take this? How can these be the same words as the one who prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them? And these psalms are given to us for us to pray also. How are we supposed to pray that? Aren't we told in the New Testament over and over to, to turn the other cheek, to love our enemies, to pray for those who hate us? Well, we have to remember that these, these are uh, not prayers that we would pray against our personal enemies. These, uh, these prayers for punishment against enemies, uh, they're called imprecations. We find them scattered throughout the psalms, but... This might be the most severe of them, asking them not to share in salvation. But this is the prayer of Christ, not against, um, not against people who have just, just uh, offended him in some small way. This is, these are the, um, the unrepentant, the obstinate, obstinate enemies of God. Of course, we pray for their, their conversion and, and for their salvation, but for those who refuse to submit to God, for those who absolutely will not believe in him or trust in him, judgment is coming. This prayer reflects that grim reality that the God who does not want anyone to perish is the same God who will put those who reject him in hell. And it is only by his grace and his mercy and his love for us that we are saved from that same fate. And so we gladly join in praying this last section of Psalm 69. The psalm ends as it began with a prayer for delivery. Uh, but the end looks a little bit different because uh, it looks beyond the suffering to the delivery uh, and to the final victory with a promise to praise that we will praise God's name when the victory is won. 
So let me read the, the last part of it. But as for me, afflicted and in pain, may your salvation, God, protect me. I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox, more than a bull with his horns and hooves. The poor will see and be glad. You who seek God, may your hearts live. The Lord hears the needy and does not despise his captive people. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and all that move in them. For God will save Zion and rebuild the cities of Judah. Then people will settle there and possess it. The children of his servants will inherit it, and those who love his name will dwell there. We rejoice because Jesus' victory is our victory. And so we rejoice with him and we praise God's name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. For the closing song today, uh, I went a different direction than I usually do. Usually I, I would include a choral number, but um, today I chose a, an arrangement by a singer and guitarist named Carl Kohlhase. Um, he has actually written music for all 150 psalms. Um, I just want to let you know he uses a a different Bible translation than you're probably used to. So I sometimes find it helpful when listening to this to follow along in my own Bible when I listen. Uh, so enjoy and may the Lord bless you uh, this Holy Week. Save me, oh God. Rising waters have reached my soul. I sink in the mire without a foothold. Deep waters like an overwhelming flood. I am weary with my crying and my throat is parched. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs on my head. They are strong, who would destroy me, attacking me with their lies. What I did not steal must I now restore. Oh God, you know my folly, my wrongs I cannot hide. May those who wait for you not be ashamed through me. O oh Lord God of hosts, may those who seek you not be dismayed through me. O oh God of Israel, for you I bear reproach, dishonor covers my face. Estranged to my brothers, foreign to my mother's sons. zeal for your house has consumed me. The reproaches aimed at you fall on me. When I fast and weep, I am dishonored. When I wear sackcloth, I become like their byword. In the city gate they sit and talk about me. I become the mocking song of the drunkards. for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the time of your favor, O God, in the greatness of your love, answer me with your saving truth, deliver from the mire, do not let me sink, save me from my foes and deep waters. May the flood not sweep over me, nor the deep swallow me whole, nor the pit shut its mouth upon me. Oh, save me, save me, save me, 
Oh, save me, save me, save me. Answer me, O oh Lord, for your love is good. In the depths of your compassion, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant. See my distress and quickly answer me. Draw near to my soul and redeem me. And ransom me from my enemies. Know my reproach, my shame, dishonor. All my enemies are set before you. Reproach breaks my heart, and I am sickened. I look for sympathy, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found no one. They give me gall for my food, and vinegar for my drink. Let their table become a snare to them, and their welfare become their own trap. May their eyes grow dim so they cannot see, and their loins always fail them. Pour on them your indignation and fierce anger. May their camp be barren, let none dwell in their tents. persecute him whom you have smitten, and they relish the pain of your wounded. Add guilt to their guilt, who miss your righteousness, may they be blotted from the book of life. I am afflicted and in pain, O God, may your salvation set me safely on high. I will praise the name of God with a song and magnify Him with thanksgiving. It will please the Lord better than an ox or a young bull with horns and hooves. The humble shall see this and be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy ones. He will not neglect all those in prison. Oh, let heaven and earth praise Him. The seas and all that moves therein. For God will save Zion and build up Judah. That they may dwell there and possess it. The descendants of his servants will inherit it, and those who love his name will dwell there. Yes, those who love his name will dwell there. Oh, those who love his name will dwell there.